This meeting to order and uh, our esteemed colleague, Lewis Jones, will do the invocation. Bow our heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we're, we know that you are always near us and beside us in all that we do. We ask that you be with us this evening as we consider the affairs of this, our great city. We give special thanks this evening for the uh, return of our mayor uh, and his uh, apparent uh, uh, well-being as he returns with us to this council this evening and we thank you Lord for that gift as we consider the, these affairs guide us and direct us give us the patience to listen the uh, wisdom to decide and the courage to de to move on we pray in your holy name amen 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 pledge of allegiance i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands one nation under god indivisible with liberty and justice for all thank you all Madam Clerk, the roll call. All present, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, and now we ask for a motion for the certification of the closed session. So moved. Second. Okay, vote is open. By a vote of 11 to 0, you have certified the closed session. Okay, now we ask for the improvement of the minutes of the informal and formal sessions of December 7th, 2021, the special uh, session of December 7th, 21, and the informal and formal sessions of December 14th, 2021. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All right, vote is open. Okay, at Wait. this point. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. I just want to explain, I was here oh, on Mr. the- I'm sorry, Mr. Tower, can I just get a verbal vote? Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Moss. I was here for December 7th, but I'm abstaining on December the 14th. I was out of town. Yes, sir. And I ha I forgot I was having surgery. Oh. That <laughs> we didn't forget, Mayor. Yeah, so uh, let's go to abstain on that one. So, you know. By a vote of uh, whatever. 9 to 0 and 8 to 0, you've approved the, the uh, minutes. Thank you. At this point, do we have any speakers for the uh, public hearing on the CAFE Franchise Agreement? Mayor, we have one. Barbara Messner. Okay. Barbara Messner, are you going to speak? Welcome. Welcome back. Um, okay, this is a cafe franchise agreement. Uh, 27th and Atlantic, that's um, Armada Hoffler Hyatt, another cafe. Um, we have too many cafes, too many alcohol establishments. The state law which y'all have gotten around with the cafes. Um, you know, it was, you're not supposed to serve and consume alcohol in public. And moving these cafes on the, the grassy knolls and out on the boardwalk, there's just too much alcohol. You have all the police and the sheriffs and everybody here, um, you know, wanting things, but you haven't taken care of them. And there's just too many car crashes. There's too many problems with their city. And adding another alcohol establishment, um, you know, is not in the best interest of our city. Thank you. Thank you. That's all, Mayor. Okay. At this point, I will read the speaker's policy. I want to remind everyone that the City Council speaker policy that allows certain representatives of groups to speak for 10 minutes applies only to planning items. 
All other speakers, whether speaking individually or on behalf of a group, will have three minutes to speak. Speakers are reminded that uh, comments during the formal portion of the meeting must be limited to the subject of the item that is being considered by the council at the time you are called. When speakers are called on each item, the clerk will call for those who have signed up to speak. We have several items with only one speaker signed up. As such, the city clerk will have will call the uh, speaker and identify each item that has been registered on. The speaker will receive three minutes to comment on each item again. The speaker must limit his or her comments to the subject matter of the items they have signed up to address. Finally, I call upon all speakers and all persons in the chamber to be civil in their discussion and decorum. Whatever views you hold and wish to express, the city council wants to hear from you and ensure that all viewpoints and all persons are respected. The best way to do this is for us to strive for civility and respect. Can you call the uh, first speaker, please? Yes, Mayor. Barbara Mesner. Hey. Ms. Mesner, the first item is 1C under ordinances. So 1A and B are pulled? You're going to speak on 1C. Okay, I ask if A and B I'm are pulled. I'm letting you know which ones you can speak on. Okay, the last time you did that, I wasn't allowed to speak again. Okay, um, amend the city code. Um, okay, so just C. Designation of city highways for golf cart operations. And roads are a disaster. You look at TV, there's nothing but a car crash every five minutes. Horrific car crashes. Um, it, is, it is absolutely uh, ridiculous to allow golf carts on our city highways. It's bad enough that you let them take up parking spaces at the beach, drive, have all the kids drive up to the 7-Eleven and get alcohol in their parents' golf carts. Um, Yeah, so I'm in opposition of putting something else dangerous on our highways. That's not an automobile. The Surreys are, are not bicycles. Everything is, is commercial. Okay, is there anything else? Or is there another speaker? Uh, the next item is one, um, I'm sorry, two, item two. Okay. Ordinance to grant a five-year franchise, this is the same one I spoke on earlier, 27th Atlantic LLC, Oscars Oceanfront, um, Atlantic Avenue, Outdoor Boardwalk Cafe in the Resort District. All the money there stays at the Resort District. He had 27 million at one time, and you pull money somewhere else to pay uh, Pay for the police. Everything is at the oceanfront, and most of y'all are directly and indirectly funded by the uh, by the private resort industry. Okay. Item three. Okay. Ordinance to authorize temporary encroachment into a portion of city right-of-ways. You know, the, the issue is you are, you're giving city land you, that we need uh, right-of-ways. Police, fire, and rescue need them. People need them. Uh, you shouldn't be using portions of right-of-ways for people to, uh, you know, for, for private citizens and for um, just more controlled growth. We have flooding. We look at the flooding this weekend. Um, yeah, so, okay. Item three. Three. I 
just didn't we just? I don't, I'm sorry. Item okay. four. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Donate. This is interesting too. Uh, crushed and reclaimed concrete uh, to Lynn Haven River now to create a sanctuary reef. Um, who reclaimed it and, and where is it, all this construction? I see all these sites all over the place. They're an absolute mess. But um, any, any extra concrete could be used for some of the people who have flooded yards and, uh, and problems, the residents. You're not going to fix flooding anytime soon, so why should it go to a Lynn Haven River now, which is a nonprofit? Uh, we're supposed to preserve that land, not have um, Lynn Haven River now and Chesapeake Bay Foundation, you know, have their, their fundraisers and schools and everything there. Okay? Item six. Six. Like I said, it's really sad that, um, you know, most people are on vacation and they're busy and they don't read the agenda or show up out of 450,000 people. Okay, six, adjust appropriated funding for CIP, Elbow Road, with a net increase of $3 million. $3 million. Um, we, we have debt. You don't, you don't have enough police, fire, rescue. It, you don't take care of, of what we have. You just destroy the trees. We have flooding. So uh, you shouldn't have any more CIP projects or expand them and expand the debt when you can't take care of, of, of your city and our citizens. Okay. 7B. So A, A and C are pulled or just, so just B right now. What about C? Did okay. you speak on A? Pardon? Did you speak on A? Oh, I can speak on A. Okay. Um, 18,000 from Edward Byrne Justice Institute Grant JAG to the 2122 police operating budget and adjust a local match provided federal funds purchase and replace um, you know a lot of equipment I don't need to mention all of it but the city is aware of how hard air um, air first responders work and there should be a budget to take care of their uh, pensions, their pay, and um, should find better ways to have uh, full force, full, full employees. So um, you're wasting your money, you're taking out more debt, and you're not taking care of essential city services, in my opinion. 7B. 7B. 64,000 from Department of Criminal Justice Services to the Police Department, certification of restrictive justice facilitators. Um, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm just reading it because if I don't read it, it's not discussed and you just rattle it off and, and vote, okay? 7C. 7C. Uh, 331,990, a third of a million, three grant awards from Department of Emergency, uh, State Emergency Medical Services, um, purchase of a regional urban area security operations trailer build security training sites on police training grounds and support active threat joint simulation training and exercise. We've had speakers speaking out about active threats. Um, 
since 2015. And they spoke out after the mass shooting. <coughs> so all of these things should have been taken care of out of the regular budget, not after all these horrible problems that we have. Okay, is that it? Gary? 8A. 8A, okay. Um, transfers. Hundred and twenty two thousand from human services operating budget to CIP project uh one hundred one hundred human services comprehensive health record systems replacement of the health care record system. Um why are you re replacing the health care record system? I mean um all right. That's all for ordinances, Mayor. Okay. Okay, I open a public hearing on planning. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Ms. Moser, you can speak on all of them up to the last one, so J1 through J8. J1 through J8. Okay, Virginia Beach Racquet Club. North Associates LP, change in zoning for R, R20, residential 20, uh, to uh, residential 40, residential district, redeveloped with three single family dwellings and variants uh, of the subdivision. Uh, Thomas Bishop Lane, that's where the racket club. I used to play tennis over there when there was a horse farm. I mean, it, everything is just rezoning, uh, and you can't take care of what you have, so. And you also allowed the racket club, the shiftlets, um, you know, to build something in Princess Anne. So everything is, everything is tied to, to the resorts, okay? To Samet Properties, Taylor Farms Land, Conditional Change of Zoning, AG1, <coughs> AG2, Agricultural Districts, uh, the green line, Ms. Henley, to Conditional 1-1 Light Industrial District, <coughs> increase 10 acres on site for additional stormwater storage in above ground pond. You don't have any place for the storm water. You're going to build a, a, a storage pond for storm water. And four, 567 million for the bond referendum on top of the three billion debt. Okay, three, Platinum Management LLC, Greenwich Road, change in zoning from light industrial to A36 apartments, redevelop the property with the 315 multifamily residential community. This is in Kempsville. Um, you know, all these multifamilies, all these huge properties, uh, the ones at the oceanfront, there's no parking. You know, um, you know it's just more and more work for our first responders and it's more traffic so until you fix the problems um, you shouldn't be increasing the density and destroying the environment okay um, Freeman shops conditional use another tattoo parlor Rose Hall Berlucci. Okay. I, I don't think we need a tattoo parlor, strip joints, vape, vaping places all over the place. Um, what do you have that's family friendly? You spent all the money on advertising TV ads for the holiday light show, Bayport, City. You know, if there's all these sponsors, why, why are we paying for it? Um, you should be able to walk on the boardwalk year-round. Okay. Um, OK, 
Okay. Another tattoo parlor. Kemsville. Oh, that's you. Um, like I said, how many tattoo parlors do we need and why are they even doing it if we have a pandemic? This, you know. All right, six. Um, Kevin and Keisha Mercer, Virginia Holdings LLC, conditional use permit, uh, assembly use in Kempsville. Um, you know, another thing about these, the breweries and the cafes, especially the breweries, I've been fighting against the brewery since 2012 because they don't have a restaurant license. They don't have to, um, they don't have to sell food and they can have events, including events, fundraisers, you know, to help people with um, the mass shooting. But the, some of them kept 75% of the, of the money. So, um, yeah, there's just too many events going on through the city. We don't have enough police and, you know, I'm, I'm just in opposition. Okay, uh, seven, another assembly use, Bayside, Mr. Jones. Okay, um, eight, Michael Siffin, Virginia Beach Investment Company, conditional use permit, mini warehouse self-storage. Uh, College Park, Centerville. Um, now these mini warehouses and self-storage, they, they double dip because a lot of them are used by people who, you know, lose their homes and they have to store things or the military who go away and then they're extended. Then they, um, they auction off the property. They're all over the place. Um, and the ones on Birdneck Road, you know, you allow Home Depot and some of these storage people to put um, a lot of the storage, not inside a storage unit, but motor coaches and all kinds of things outside, outside of the, uh, the property. Okay. Nine? No, there's, that one's being pulled. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Vice Mayor, if you can kindly do the consent agenda. Yes, under ordinances. Uh, 1C, Section 7-66, regard designation of city highways for golf cart operation. Number 2, ordinance to grant a five-year franchise agreement to 27th Atlantic LLC, trading as Oscars Oceanfront at 2613 Atlantic Avenue regarding outdoor boardwalk, cafe, and resort area, which is District C Beach. Number three, ordinance to authorize a temporary encroachment into a portion of city right away known as Kempsville Road, formerly Great Bridge Road, at the front of 720 Kempsville Road regarding reconstruct and maintain a concrete driveway. That's District 2, Kempsville. Number four, ordinance to donate crushed and reclaimed concrete to the Lynn Haven River now, recreating a sanctuary reef in the western branch of the Lynn Haven River. Number five is full. Number six, ordinance to adjust appropriated funding for capital project 100159, <coughs> Elbow Road extended phase 11C, with a net increase of $2,937.87. Council District 1, Centerville, and 7, Princess Anne. Uh, under number 7, the ordinance to accept and appropriate, this is A, $18,603 from the Edward Byrne Justice Assistance Grant, JAG, to the FY 2021-22 Police Operations Budget, and authorize a local match, 25% of the provided federal funds, regarding purchase of eight replacement automated external defibrillators, 16 defibrillator pads, 12 mounted patrol helmets, and 12 protective horse nose guard with visors. And B, $64,000 from the Department of Criminal Justice Services to the Police Department regards certification 
of restrictive justice facilitators. And C, $333,990 for three grant awards from the Virginia Department of Emergency to the FY 2021-22 Emergency Management Operating Budget regarding purchase a regional urban area security operations trailer, build security training sites on police training grounds, and support active threat joint stimulation training and exercise. And number eight, the ordinance to transfer a, 122,000 for FY 2021-22 Human Services Operating Budget to CIP Project 100100 Human Services Comprehensive Health Records System regard replacement of the health care records system with Mr. Moss voting no. Uh, B, uh, 162,347 dollars from the FY 21-22 Public Works Operating Budget to Capital Projects 100364, Schilling Point Neighborhood Dredging District 5, Lynn Haven, with Mr. Jones abstaining. I open a public hearing on planning. Uh, number one, the Virginia Beach Racquet Club, North Associates LP, for a change of zoning from R20 for a residential district to R40 residential district regarding the redevelopment with three single family dwellings and a variance to section four of the subdivision regulations re regarding street line frontage at 951 Thomas Bishop Lane, District 5, Lynn Haven. Number two, Samet Properties LLC, Taylor Farms Land Company LLC for conditional change of zoning from Ag 1 and Ag 2, Agriculture District for conditional. A I-1 light industrial district regarding increase of 10 acres on insight for additional stormwater storage in a above ground pond at 2097 Harpers Road, that's District 6 Beach. Number three, the Platinum Management LLC at 5429 Greenwich Road, Virginia LLC conditional change of zoning from I-1 light industrial to conditional A36 apartments regarding development the property with a 315 unit multifamily residential com community at 5429 Greenwich Road. That's District 2 Kempsville with uh, Mr. Moss and Ms. Henley voting no. <clears throat> Number four, Monet Freeman Shops LLC for conditional use permit to uh, regarding tattoo parlor at 4380 Holland Plaza Shopping Center. That's District 3, Rose Hall. Number five, Tr Triana Mills, Providence Square Office Park, Associates for Conditional Use Permit regarding Tattoo Parlor at 1017 Kempsville Road. That's District 2, Kempsville. Number six, Keith and Keisha Mercer, R RT Virginia Holdings, LLC, for Conditional Use Permit regarding Assembly Use at 5300 Kemps River Drive, Suite 126. That's District 2, Kempsville. Number seven, Jody Calgana, HCD Properties, LC, for conditional use permit for assembly use at 3752 Euclid Road, and that's District 4, Bayside, with Mr. Moss voting no. And number eight, Michael D. Siphon, Virginia Beach Investment Company, for a conditional use permit regarding a mini warehouse, self storage at the Southwest intersection of College Park Boulevard and Providence Road. That's District 1, Centerville. Okay, do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second, I just want to confirm. Did you say, I might have misheard you, did you have me down as no for 8A? Did you did you say that? I believe so, yes. Okay, I, don't, I thought you did, but I just want to confirm. Thank you. I do have an mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I do have yeah. an explanation at the end. Okay, votes open on the consent agenda. Oh. By a vote of 11 to 0, you have approved the consent agenda as read by Vice Mayor Wilson, noting Mr. Moss's nay vote on items, um, ordinances 8A and planning items 3 and 7, and Mrs. Henley's nay vote on planning item number 3, and Mr. Jones' abstention on ordinance number 8B. Okay, thank you all very much for that. Can I okay. explain my no, no votes? Yeah, please, Mr. I'd like to always explain my no votes when I dissent from the majority 
on the issue of the additional $122,000 for the human services operating budget that actually is an increase over the CIP that we just approved back in May I, I found the explanation for the process for the amount of the increase plus the process that we got there to be unsatisfactory and I just couldn't reward that kind of execution with regards to item three platinum LLC I want to thank Mr. Tahan for answering my question, he did confirm that while there was staff discussion relative to the industrial uses on the property, there was no assessment of the opportunity cost of adopting a, a rezoning that really undermines our strategic plan to increase our diversification of our tax base, nor was that part of the record that we received. And I find without further discussion and amplification, to not act in, in alignment with our strategic plan for increasing our tax base away from residential use, I find that to be inconsistent, and so I'm voting no. With regards to the assembly use on Euclid Road, my concern was, that I expressed in a formal session, that we exclusively prohibited any kind of uh, amplified sound or speaking at a like assembly use, I say like, in Kentsville, but yet we were allowing it in Bayside for certain periods of time, and I think we should either be consistent or be able to prove and establish here in a public hearing conclusively why there was a difference. They couldn't do that, so I'm voting no. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moss. Ms. Henley. Uh, my no vote on uh, item three for platinum management. Uh, this is for a 315-unit apartment complex on 10 acres on Greenwich Road. I just find that to be extremely dense um, given the fact that we have a what I consider very uh, minimum incomplete application. I think there are many questions that are unanswered and I cannot support it at this time. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, um, now we're going to, um, you know, go to the um, regular uh, agenda here and first one is ordinance to amend city code and that would be section 2-6 ray resort area commission rack regarding the composition uh, of requirements as requested by council member tower mayor we have one speaker barbara mesner Okay. A resort advisory committee, RAC, have attended the RAC, council appointed RAC, since the 90s. Um, you know, we shouldn't have council appointed RAC. Uh, it's ridiculous. Resort advisory. Everything is for the resort. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm in opposition um, to all, all the, the money and the time, uh, you know, spent on the resort uh, and amending city codes without, without due process. I mean, you know, over the holiday weekend, we get this, and it was, I think it was 347 pages. I forget what this one is. But most people are on vacations. They're dealing with other things, and there's, there's just too much going on. But we shouldn't be amending city codes without more, more process and more public engagement. And Ms. Henley said, you know, that I was, anyone's welcome to her meetings, but her meetings, the only person that has, uh, meetings where we can ask y'all questions is Miss Henley and that's at five o'clock and um, you know I, I just don't think we have enough input for all these uh, all these amendments and changes to our city codes thank you thank you okay is there a motion then we'll have a discussion so move second Okay, any discussion? Mr. Moss. Well, first of all, if this wasn't an issue of where an organization that has an organizational representation on the board wrote a letter saying they asked not to be 
considered because they're not they don't want to be on the board at this time so I just want to make clear that we're not changing RAC policy we are responding to an organization that had an organizational seat on the RAC and they've expressed in writing they want to be removed their organization removed as representation so that part I have no issue with my issue is that <coughs> there is not sufficient diversity of representation on this group and i've expressed that and i won't go into what i've expressed in executive session in the past where this is nothing new so i saw this as an opportunity to say fine the cco council civic organizations no longer can sustain participation and is we voluntary and requested to be removed that's they're right but here's an opportunity to convert the seat and let's look to create some diversity from people who come from the the middle part of the city and of different diversity and bring something new to the group well, obviously that's not happening tonight but I think that discussion isn't unique to this board we have the Virginia Beach Development Authority we have a number of highly placed policy influential positions that don't represent socioeconomic diversity and don't represent other types of diversity and we are missing out on innovation that could come from that and these things operate like clubs and that's how the public perceives them and I don't think I'm stepping out of line and saying that and if you're out there in the hither lens you'll hear that so I'm not I'm gonna vote yes to allow them to withdraw but I want to make because that makes sense but I'm also saying is I'm not voting to appoint new people until we get a approach on me across all our boards on how to increase the diversity of our boards and that's our and I agree with Mr. that's our job we can't expect the rack to say let's have representation from other than people heavily involved with resorts that's not going to happen but we are the people accountable for diversity and I'm going to be pursuing that and I hope other people will join me as we look at these groups because they fall short of what the public should expect from us and our appointments in my judgment okay thank you anybody else Mr. Tower I would just <clears throat> respond in two ways. Number one, to make it clear, the Council of Civic Organizations did not withdraw from RAC because of any dissatisfaction with RAC. I think if you asked the member who represented them, he would say to the contrary. He was very happy to be involved. It, the, that organization essentially has gone on hiatus generally and has withdrawn its uh, external contacts including including ours and second uh, I, I welcome diversity uh, suggestions of diversity in RAC I invite <coughs> members of council to uh, propose membership of people that they think would make a good member of RAC I think I think I've got to say I think uh, the Resort Advisory Commission number one's done a fantastic job representing the resort area for the benefit of the entire <coughs> city it is a stakeholder group but it is largely, I won't say 100%, but it is largely done so to promote the general welfare of this uh, city and, and uh, uh, make its resort area pay off, if you will, for the city. Uh, but number two, uh, beating on rack because of a lack of diversity. I think if you examine all of the city appointments we have, and I, I welcome looking at all others I don't think RAC is any more or less diverse than any other specialty group uh, either as to ethnicity race uh, involvement with the community that it essentially represents or other otherwise so I welcome the opportunity to have more diversity in RAC I think the leadership of RAC does as well and I also welcome that same opportunity for uh, st staffing other city committees and commissions I think it's it's not just an obligation it's good business sense and uh, we should pay more attention to it um, and I certainly join in doing that thank you anyone else did we have a motion okay oh, it's on the table okay Close. by a vote of 11 to 0 you've approved the ordinance Okay, moving on to the next one. Uh, item B, sections 5 5 uh, 531 
uh, 213032371.23 uh, 7.527-7 and 35 at uh, 38 5 and uh, repeal section 2122 of Ray law inform uh, law enforcement officers requested by the sheriff mr. mayor yes pursuant to state and local government conflict of interest act section 2.2 tac 3115 code of Virginia I will abstain from City Council's consideration of this item and I have a letter on file with the clerk Thank you. Uh, could we call the speakers, please? First speaker is Barbara Mesner, and then the next speaker will be Melissa Lukeson. Okay, which item again? One B. One B. One B. Like I said, it's impossible with limited time to look up all these things. Um, requested by the sheriff's office. Um, yeah, I just, my issue is with how the city is managed and all this talk about the rack. I mean, Billy Almond's been there since the 90s when I used to go. And then the rep from um, Dominion you know, who's still around uh, pushing the bond referendum. It's like, it is special interest. Um, and my issue, which I'm going to bring up, you know, this is, um, and the, the monitors don't work. So, um, you're not managing the city properly. And, and the citizens are not involved. You appoint who you want. Okay, this is uh, 2018. Um, truth and accounting. You know, it was 874.8 million money needed to pay your bills in 2018. You're ranked 43 in the country. Uh, taxpayer burden. Uh, 5,700 uh, per, you know, per uh, citizen. I mean, everybody doesn't pay taxes. Um, and financial grade of D. And the most recent one is 2019. Um, you're still getting a grade, grade D, but we don't have any, anything for 2020 with the pandemic and businesses closing or 2021. Uh, we have a debt burden of 916 million. 916 million is missing uh, for you to pay bills, to pay down the debt. So, thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Melissa Lukeson, and then Sheriff Stolly. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Um, I won't be too terribly long. Um, I do believe that we are speaking on 1B, which is regarding the change of the ordinance regarding law enforcement officials, right? All right, just making sure. Um, I am just speaking about this because I would like you guys to take this into con Serious consideration, law enforcement official changing police in the city ordinance to law enforcement official concerns me as a citizen. And it concerns me as a citizen because if you look at what defines a law enforcement official, that there's a lot that's federal, state. It's a very broad term just to say a law enforcement official, right? So for me as a citizen to know that police in the city ordinance for the locality is what the ordinance is to make that change to law enforcement official based on the sheriff's request because the sheriff assists in part-time you know they send for part-time work that sheriffs can go down and work at the oceanfront it's been assisting obviously because virginia beach police has had some staffing issues just like many people have um and is it going to be temporary 
because they, they don't have the same training. They don't go through the same training. They don't work with the community in the same way. And I'm not disparaging in any way the Sheriff's Department. I think they do a wonderful job at what they do. But by changing an entire city ordinance to say law enforcement official um, or law enforcement officer, that's a broad, broad title to actually change our city ordinance. And I'm just afraid that that could be used um, in, in a way with our citizens that, that could be detrimental. Um, and I would just really ask that you guys specifically, like I looked at just 20, section 23-7.1, 23-7.5, 7.1, 23-7.2, 23-7.3, those three specifically I looked at and as a citizen I am concerned about making that change to just a blanket law enforcement official I mean a fire marshal is a law enforcement official um, ATF is a law enforcement official the state trooper is a law enforcement official so if we just say that they can make citations like how's a sheriff that's doing traffic on Great Neck Road for uh, like as example Spring Branch Church right they do traffic on Sundays if if they're allowed to do citations or I mean, I would assume that you have to issue a summons. You have to have a citation for a summons. Okay, I'm not a law pro professional, but um, how how are they going to do that? How is a sheriff going to then pursue that in a safe way for our community? Because we already have a problem currently in our community with training with Virginia Beach police officers. I don't want to add to that problem, and I want you guys to seriously consider this. Thank you very Thank much. You. Mm -hmm. Next speaker is... Sheriff Stolly. I didn't really intend to speak on this tonight, but I'll be happy to. This is this is simply a code change, and, and you know that we did this at the, at, the, at the General Assembly years ago. We've had, we had statutes that said police can do this, sheriffs can do this, uh, other people can do other things. DMV and justice can do this, and so we just combined all that and defined what a law enforcement officer was and did that. Now I've worked with this uh, Tim. Uh, Oaksman has worked with the city attorney, and I think the city attorney is in full support of this, but he got some questions the other night about liability, and, and he wanted to defer this to uh, answer those questions about liability, and I have, I'm in total agreement with that, and that's why I had intended on speaking on this bill tonight, but uh, I, there's nothing wrong with this bill. The, the, the deputies are out there walking the beach with the police officers because they have to be augmented, and, and uh, I think that you know that there's there could be some confusion and enforcement of these bills if it says police officer and doesn't include law enforcement officers or deputy sheriffs in that. You know, the Code of Virginia says I'm the senior law enforcement officer in this area, and I have the responsibility of enforcing all the laws. And the people that work for me have the responsibility, uh, share that responsibility. And so I think that you know it's just it's just a. Uh, much to do about nothing. Tim was trying to correct the code to make sure it was clear about who could make arrests, and that's all this is about. And so it's not adding a different, it's not adding addition, additional authority to us. We're defined as law enforcement officers at the state level, and I'd say uh, I, I believe that the state level covers that. And so, but I, I think that you know the wise thing to do is correct the statutes at the local level because I'm sure they didn't think about you know sheriffs enforcing the law and, and the city ordinances at the time. And I, I don't think uh, Mr. Stiles has any problems with this either. I don't want to speak for him, but I don't think he does. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Sheriff. That's all, Mayor. Okay, uh, we have a motion and then we'll have discussion. Mr. Mr. Branch? I'd make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and second. I have a Mr. substitute Moore. motion to defer. Second. And the reason, thank you, and the reason why, because I don't think it's just as simple as the law, but everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but I think there's more involved here. I asked, did ask a lot of questions, and I think all of you got a copy of the questions that I asked, so I'm going to walk through those questions and share those with the public and talk about the ones that I think are still germane and reason for the deferral. First of all, I asked are the deputy sheriffs once, this is a liability issue, you know, and I also asked, would they be subject to, in doing these functions, subject to the oversight council that we are establishing? Because this has been a big issue with the community over which we have expended tremendous time and political capital to get to a consensus, I do believe. And the answer was no, they're not. So when they're out there interacting with the public and someone files a complaint, their only recourse is to the sheriff. So that's a big difference and something we've talked about, and people should be aware of that. And I'm not saying that people can't come to different conclusions, but you need to be prepared to 
talk to the public about how you came to the conclusions you did. And then I asked about was there impact on liability, risk management, and all those issues where they were marginal to know, so that was good to know. Then about what qualifications does a citizen police officer, a police officer have to meet versus a sheriff, and they're substantially different. They do not have the same number of hours or the same scope of training. So that is also something to consideration. But this was something, and first of all, I want the public to know we didn't get this till last Friday. That was the first time any city council member saw that this was coming forward was last Friday. I'm sure you all know what last weekend was, so I'm sure everybody was busily reading the council agenda at home when the football games were on. Probably not. But that the sheriff and the police chief are working on a modification to an existing mutual aid agreement to provide clarity regarding when and how the sheriff's personnel are deployed at the request of the police department. Now, I really think that we probably ought to be seeing what that agreement is before we vote on this. I think that's only fair, that's being wise, because I've had, had a little bit of involvement with operational issues on a, on a, on a uniform side, and you want to know who's, who's has OPCON, operational control, and who has administrative control. Those are big issues. And you want to know how you're going to explain to the public, we have one set of people policing our public that have independent accountability, and another group that does not. I would like us to pursue with the new Attorney General soon, on January 15th, thank goodness, and find out if the opinion we just heard is the opinion that the current Commonwealth, the Attorney General would conclude and share, that's the same. Because why else would you have city police departments and sheriff's departments? Because usually when that happens, their principal role is what? Correctional facilities, jails, and protection and security of the courts. So I think that's just something we ought to get a third party judgment on that versus the person that's requested it, which might be slightly biased, in the, and I might be too. So I'm just saying, I think we don't have all the information that we should have before we say this is the right answer. And I don't see how we're adversely impacted as if the sheriff proclaims that he already has this authority. What is the harm to the danger to the public to know what this agreement is and whether or not the interpretation we've seen here to write is correct? And I would just say defer this until that information is available. I don't know if that could be achieved in two weeks or three weeks, but we got to see that agreement. I don't know what the city manager, what the timeline for that agreement is, but I think at a minimum, all of us should see that agreement before we vote on this issue. Okay, we have a substitute motion for deferral on the table. Anybody else? Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, not to echo the, the sentiments of Councilman Moss, I agree with a lot of what he said. Um, one of the things, first of all, I want to thank Sheriff Stolle in this office, um, the sheriff, is, um, for the work that they do in our community and for having our VBPD back at, at times where we ask you guys to step in. Um, but, you know, I have serious concerns about this piece of ordinance. Um, number one, I think what stands out to me is, is the way that it was brought forth. This is a piece of ordinance that's going to impact our entire city where, um, as is written, sheriff's officers can can um, write summons and citations. And that is, to me, uh, requires public um, engagement. Um, and there was absolutely no public engagement whatsoever on this piece of ordinance. So what our public think about having um, sheriff's officers being able to have that ability um, here. And so I think that's, that's a huge uh, concern for me um, as well. Um, the other concern, um, we talked about the oversight and Councilman Moss pointed out, um, you know, I don't want to, we, we seem to try to solve one issue of providing oversight for uh, Virginia Beach Police Department, and then we're going to create another issue by, you know, reforming or repealing the ordinance that gives another law enforcement body no oversight, which just simply goes to an elected officer um, of our city. Um, to me, that's, that's trading one problem for another. I think it would be wise to see what this agreement is like and to further this item. The other uh, issue uh, that stands out um, is the fact that um, there is difference between sheriffs and our, and our police department. Um, I think our sheriff's office and Sheriff Stolle has off you, you've done a great job of really um, um, looking at the mental health issues that go on within our, our jail systems and how that's ran. Um, but there's a significant um, difference, in my opinion, 
in, in training to where, you know, our sheriff's office, um, they do they are primarily trained, as, as Councilman Moss stated, um, here to see uh, court training specific to jailers, civil, civil process and court training. And they go through 480 hours of department approved training. Well, our academy provides 700 or 960 hours of training. And so that's a huge difference. And 960 hours of training is, is being able to um, meet the public out in the public in these public spaces. Um, for our sheriffs are used to dealing with inmates, inmates as well, um, who are uh, who are all participants who gave up their constitutional rights um, when they decided to uh, to break the law. With that being said, I, our sheriff's office does a great job when we ask them to step in from the shortage of our short staff of our Virginia Beach Police Department. That lies the bigger issue. How do we recruit, um, retain more Virginia Beach Police officers so we don't have to depend on a sheriff's office to step in to do to help them out with that job? Um, so with those differences, I think there's we have to do and I think the public is deserves um, more engagement before we we make a a, a significant impact like this this ordinance here because this this has a significant impact to our community. Thank okay, you. thank you, Mr. Bellucci. Thank you, Mayor Dyer. Well, I do have a question maybe of the city attorney, and um, and Sheriff Stolle may be able to answer this question as well. But could you help me understand a little bit better the differentiation in law enforcement responsibilities between the police department and the sheriff's office, and also from my understanding what the sheriff's office is permitted by state code to do but chooses not to do or exercises restraint in doing um, in deference to the police department I, I just want to make sure that for me and also the public are clear about those differentiation of responsibilities and then I have some comments I'd like to share well I will share with you the text of the two statutes that I believe uh, address the issue that you raised and I'm glad you asked because I was going to volunteer them uh, anyway um, 15.2-1609 of the Virginia Code uh, defines the position of the sheriff which of course is a constitutional officer and it provides the voter in every county and city shall elect a sheriff unless otherwise provided by general law the sheriff shall exercise all the powers conferred and perform all the duties imposed upon sheriffs by general law. And then here's the, the sentence that I think is relevant to your inquiry. He shall enforce the law or see that it is enforced in the locality from which he is elected. And then it goes on to talk about other duties, assist in the judicial process, be charged with the custody, feeding, and care of all prisoners confined in the county or city jail. He may perform such other duties not inconsistent with his office as may be requested of him by the governing body, which is this council. And then it says the sheriff shall be elected as provided by general law. Then section 15.2-1701 talks about the organization of a local police force in a city or town. And that code section provides any locality may, by ordinance, provide for the organization of, an, of, of its authorized police forces. Such forces shall include a chief of police and such other officers and other personnel as appropriate. When a locality provides for a police department, the chief of police shall be the chief law enforcement officer of that locality. So the sheriff does have authority to enforce the law. In fact, it says in 1609 he has a duty to enforce the law. But this council has enacted an ordinance providing for the organization of its own police department and so the chief law enforcement officer in Virginia Beach is the chief of police. Now, I will let M M Sheriff Stolle or someone from the police department elucidate further on this, but the information that was provided to us when we prepared this was that there has been an increasing frequency over the past couple of years where the police chief asks the sheriff's office to supplement his forces for example on a on a maybe on a weekend at the ocean front when they get down there there are certain they, they have the authority under the ordinance or the statute the virginia statute that i read you to enforce the law but things come up like asking a a, a, a citizen for identification based on on reasonable suspicion or probable cause the way 
the city code section is written, only a police officer can make that request. And so the intent here was so that when the police chief asks for the sheriff's office's assistance and they come to provide that assistance, they have the authority under that specific ordinance to do that specific thing, which under a technical reading of the current section they don't have. So that's the background and that was the purpose. And, and I don't know how anything else that I can add to be responsive. No, I, I don't think, it, for me, you, you don't need to add anything else. I think you explained that clearly and carefully and I appreciate it. Um, and with respect to, you know, some of the characterizations of the training that occurs at the sheriff's office versus what happens at the police department, um, I'm not an expert on either, but I do take exception to the characterization that somehow the training that happens at the, the sheriff's office is either inferior or different in such that the, the, uh, the, well, that was the implication I heard, but, but that's, but Mr. Rouse, I'll, if you'd allow me well, to continue. Okay. Okay. Don't, okay. Don't, well, don't put words in my mouth, mouth because I did not I say that. Okay. I did not say that. I didn't put yeah, words in your mouth. Let's stay in order, gentlemen. And I said the sheriff department is very well trained. So to okay. insinuate that to him to take exception is out of line. I took okay. exception to any implication that well, was made to that, that to that effect. That. And I didn't name you by Be name. Be very careful, Michael. I am being careful. And so the reason that I bring this up is because sheriff's officers are trained in this respect. And the reason that I, this is relevant is because when the police department asked the sheriff's department to support them in their efforts, we expect them to do that. It's a, it's a matter, it's a question of public safety. And I think the citizens of Virginia Beach have an expectation that this council supports law enforcement officers all across the city of Virginia Beach. And when they go to the ocean front, and, and it could be the ocean front, or it could be a, an event that occurs at town center or some other place in our city that requires support from the sheriff's office. And so what message is this council sending to law enforcement professionals to say, we want you to go to the scene, but you can't enforce the law? That's a dangerous message to send, and it's one I can't support. And that's and that's effectively what that's effectively what's been communicated here today, as I understand it. And I'm not putting words in anyone's mouth, but there were comparisons made about training. And I want to clarify that these trainings, while different, are are, are not necessarily different, such that the sheriff's officers aren't capable of doing this in a way that's responsible and effective. And you know, I have concerns about the way that was characterized. characterized. Mayor, okay. may I, after Mr. After yeah. Mr. Bellucci. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Well, I would like the sheriff, looks like Sheriff Stolle does have some thoughts here, and, and if he would, I'd, I'd like to, to uh, hear his opinion on this. Well, okay, uh, first I'd like Mr. Rouse. Thank you, because I'd like to hear Sheriff Stolle's opinion as well. But let's, let's get something straight here. There is a difference between police department, the police department is trained, and how our sheriffs are trained point blank difference. No one said or anything about any department being inferior. So we need to stop playing politics with our law enforcement officers. We all support law enforcement officers. We have spent a budget. We have spent a budget just last quarter. I'm proud of the service that these men and women do in both offices. So don't cut, cut, cut that. Don't do that. You're, you're better than that. You are better than that because what we are talking about it's giving more authority to the sheriff's office than what they typically have. We're not talking about how they perform. They perform their duties well. But who, whoever said they were, they were performing, underperforming? No one said that. In fact, I even said they have the back of our Virginia Beach police officers because we have run a shortage on officers for quite some time. They've always been there. Sheriff Stolle's always been there to answer the call of our chief of police. But that's not what this conversation is about. This is about expanding their authority, period. It is. And so there is a difference in training. When you have, and let me get it correct. When you have 480 hours of training, compared to 960 hours, there is a difference. 480 hours of training, 960 hours of training.
that is a difference. I'm sure if the sheriff would provide his office, if his sheriff's officers were given 960 officers, they would not only, because they already performed that way, but they would be in better line to um, protect themselves and our city against liability issues. But that is an issue. And a matter of fact, our Virginia Beach police officers put in 960 hours and more, and our sheriff's officers are well trained as well, so this is not about that. But there's a difference in the hours that they train. But 960 hours to interact and engage with the public firsthand in all kind of different environments. So I am even more supportive that the sheriff's office, when they are asked to go down to the ocean front or town center or anywhere in between to supplement the police um, department, I think that's great on their part because it shows how well they're trained. But we're talking about legislation and ordinance and what does it provide. So don't go there when you talk about Councilman Rouse is implying or implying someone is inferior. I never said That's that. not the case. Okay. Those are your words. Okay. The, yeah, I'd like to respond. Okay, there. but let's keep the quorum, okay? Oh, we're going to have a spirit. This, 20, this 2022. We're going to have a spirit decorum and a spirit debate. But don't play politics with our law enforcement officers. Don't play politics with our city. This is very important. There was no public engagement about how this Mr. Mayor, impacts I the city. I had the floor. Thank you. Period. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm not playing politics with law enforcement, and I resent the implication. Also, let's just, let's just get back to the matter at hand. Uh, I could speak further on that, and, and I regret that I feel the need to, but I want to focus out of respect and deference to the, the men and women who serve our city. Let's, let's keep the focus on the matter at hand. Yes, there's maybe a difference in the hours of training, but there's also a question of ongoing training, and, there, and also let me be clear about, and this is something the sheriff could speak to much more competently than, than I can, but also let me be clear about the fact that there was, it, and I'm not attributing these words to any specific person, but there was a claim made the sheriff's officers are focused on the jail. There was all, there's no reference to the um, civil, uh, civil service that they do in providing security or in serving papers or in training for emergency situations which come up. So we can talk about the hours of initial training, but that doesn't include, and it discounts, frankly, the additional supplemental training and ongoing training that happens. So no one's playing politics with law enforcement here. We're all seeking the same goal, which is a safe community. And what my point is, and I, and I, and I maintain this concern, what message are we sending to law enforcement officers who are duly trained, and we can get into the granular level of what this training entails, but I just want to emphasize that sheriff's officers are trained to be effective and professional in these environments. And I want to be absolutely clear that that's the case, and I have the utmost confidence. This is not political. This is a matter of policy, and that is the question at hand. So we're, we're all on the same team here, which is Team Virginia Beach, and we all want the same thing, which is a safe community. We may have some differences of opinion about how to arrive at that place. And my opinion is that if we're asking trained law enforcement officers to support the police department, we should give them the tools they need to do so. Thank you. Okay. Like it. Yeah, Mr. Moss. Thank you. I think the key here is it isn't just the law enforcement community. It's also are we providing to take to his point, you're going to ask someone to provide identification, authority they now don't have. Mm -hmm. So someone, for whatever reason, decides they don't want to provide it. Who knows what? That turns into some kind of altercation. Who knows what? Someone says he said, she said. Now someone wants to file a complaint. Mm -hmm. Now, do we have the same level of accountability? We always hear about parity in this room. I mean, I don't believe in parity personally, and I've said that before, but it is the status quo position of parity. We don't have parity on accountability because some citizen who's stopped by a police officer has a numerous pass of we can take to have their issue reviewed independently and not by the person who's running the agency. When that person is a sheriff, that's not the case. Now, it may well be in this memorandum of agreement, which we haven't seen, and I think this is the the substance of which we should have before we were being asked to vote on this, because this gets to be talk about rules of engagement. It's going to talk about OpCon, I hope. It's going to talk about AdCon, I'm certain. And it should talk about when acting in the role of, for the heart of the police department, 
why can't that individual for that instant be accountable and have their actions accountable to our civilian review board? Obviously, the sheriff would have to agree to that, but then we would be holding people who are exercising authority they now don't have, as articulated by the city attorney, would be held to the same accountability and oversight as our police officers who have, in, have pretty much embraced the policy we've adopted. So it isn't so much about what they're doing, it's are they being held to the same level of accountability to all the people that we serve and that they serve? This isn't about who's better or who could do it better, but when we're making these changes, did we consciously agree and understand there is two standards of accountability exercising the same authority that now solitarily rests with the police department? And that's out of all the questions that I asked, that was the most consequential insight is accountability for the actions being taken by someone exercising the people's duly power of exercising force on another citizen. And we fought long and hard, or I should say discuss, fought's not the wrong word. We worked long and hard to come to a consensus on how to achieve accountability for both the citizen and the law enforcement officer, the police officer, and now when we do this, in that instance that you said uniquely they can't do today, they would be held to a different process of accountability than our police officers, and we just need to consciously know that we're making that choice. Okay, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Wooten. So I, I appreciate uh, the spirited conversation here because it brings out further information that we need to consider. And that's what we're here for. We're here to make sure before we make a decision and we change an ordinance or ordinances that we have all the information that we need. We weigh in on the different perspectives, how it impacts the public because this will impact the public. And from what I'm hearing is duties and authority that the sheriff department may not have now, they will have when this, when and if the ordinance is changed, the public needs to weigh on, weigh in on that. And there also should be some type of communication as to how this is going to change and how the public is supposed to understand how it's going to impact them. Because uh, Council Member Moss has a good point. If the member of the Sheriff Department does not have the authority or had not had the authority to ask for identification, me as a citizen or other citizens would say, why am I supposed to render that information to you? And there will be an altercation. So we have to really think these things through. I do think we need a delay or deferral to get gather more information, to do our due diligence before we change these ordinances that may negatively impact the public. And I have heard from some members of the public who have the same concern. And so before we do this, or before we make any changes, let's consider all of the facts and the information that has come out tonight through my colleagues before we make a decision. I think that's prudent before we make this decision. Hey, Mr. Uh, Bellucci, were you going to sponsor uh, Sheriff Stolle for uh, clarification? Yes. Okay. Thank if he would like to. I apologize for bringing this before you today. I thought it was going to be deferred. And, and you, know, you guys have spent more time on this than I have. And so, you know, it's much to do about nothing. We already have the authority. This is just changing four statutes to reflect that, to put that, that are inconsistent with the authority that we already have. And, and Councilman Riles, we don't, we don't need 900 hours. I got quick learners on the sheriff's department. And so, yes. but uh, I, I think. A we, UVA we, grad. We, we, we have, we have our own yeah, and so, But our jobs are different and, and, and we train for our jobs. And, and so something I'd point out to you all that when I came here 12 years ago, I wanted to take and have all my, all my deputy sheriffs go through the police qualifications and go through the mass, the, the, uh, the uh, patrol school and have the same education as the police officers did. It was the chief of police that stopped that. 
we tried to do it, and, and he stopped that. Now we have a, 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 a new chief of police, and he's working very closely with us, and we're sharing all sorts of stuff. And so I think we're on the right track now. But let me, let me, let me tell you what I did when I was chairman of the Courts of Justice Committee in Richmond. I said, first thing you have to do if you're passing a bill is make sure it does no harm. And that's all you all are asking for now. And so I don't, I don't see that there's any difficulty in deferring this bill. And, and I think that, uh, you know, you have to make sure you're not doing any harm when you pass legislation. And I think that's what Mr. Moss and Mr. Rouse is suggesting. So I don't, uh, uh, Mr. Bellucci, I appreciate the effort, but I, I don't think it, you ought to push criminal bills through without knowing how they're going to impact everything. And I think that, you know, when you're talking about taking people's freedom away and when you ask somebody for, to identify themselves, you're taking their freedom away. They don't have to do that. They don't have to identify themselves. And so, you know, I'd say to you that we already have this authority. But if you guys are, don't feel comfortable with it, then let it go. Let it go. It, 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 it's not going to change the damn thing I do out there. You know, it, my officers have, the, they, my officers have the, the authority to do this now, and and, and this just this just a cleanup bill. That's all it is. And so I, I, I don't see that there's much, many problems with passing or letting it go. Okay, Mr. Rouse, Sheriff Scalia, I, I, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for your, your clarification and your support as well. Um, just trying to understand exactly. When you see something for the first time, questions, more information on it as well, trying to get to the bottom of what does it actually mean, what does it mean for our community, what does right. it mean for our sheriff's department, what does it mean for our Virginia Beach Police Department um, as well. And uh, I thank you for uh, supporting a, a deferment, but more more so thank you for your, your, your calm demeanor uh, and, and your lively jokes. I, I really do appreciate oh, um, thank you. your Nobody service. Thank you. Nobody appreciates my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, another thing, I appreciate your, your service to um, to our city. When I first came on council back in 18, your department as well has been a, a tremendous help to me. Um, and, and again, and that is that goes far, far, um, you know, as, as a regular citizen, you guys always came out to Rouse's house and support our endeavors and supporting the community um, as well. And so I, I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. So, Ken, would it be prudent? I really think, uh, if I could ask uh, one question to the uh, city manager, Chief Newdigate is in conversation working on this? Um, from my understanding, the chief and the sheriff's office there working collaboratively on updating the mutual aid policy. That's what would have to come back to council. For council would there be any that. harm with a, you know, a no, no long we, deferral? We, we can produce a mutual yeah. aid. Now, what we did with our mutual aid, we already have a mutual aid agreement, but yeah. we, it's pretty much limited to jurisdictional things because we've got jurisdiction in the courts and the jail and, and some surrounding areas and civil process. They have jurisdiction, law enforcement responsibilities throughout. So we wanted to make sure that we had an understanding if we had a shooting, shooting situation in the jail or the courthouse, who's responsible and how it works. And so th that's it. Now, and there's a lot of things that you all haven't, you're touching on the verge of, of, of discussing, but you haven't discussed it yet. You know, Virginia Beach Police Department has to turn to us to augment them. They can't call in other police departments unless the state of emergency is declared. Now we're going to try and get that law changed here soon, but the, the, the responsibility is of uh, you know, the, of the police department, they got to turn to us to ask for, and once we're, we're exhausted, they have to declare a state of emergency. And so I think we're, what, what we'll do to answer your questions is we'll include in the mutual agreement the risk management issues and stuff like that because the sheriff's deputies are, are state-funded insurance and the risk management, and there's a $1.5 million cap on the liability. And, and, and there's a $1.5 million insurance policy for every deputy out there. So there's no, there's no liability from the state level you know, but if they sue federally and stuff like that, then you, you, you could have some problems. But I think that, you know, we, we can address all those issues in the mutual aid agreement. I think that it's a good idea to do that. Yeah. I'll tell you, at this point, you know, what I'm saying is that this council is unified in wanting to get this done. I think it's just a matter of timing, right. explanation, how do we explain it to the public? You know, how, how do we just get the uh, dots crossed and everything? I'm grateful for your relationship with uh, Chief Newdigate, but I just think it, at this point it might be prudent to, you know, to allow for a delay. Let's get it right. And I think it's much to do about nothing. It's not going to change the way we do business. It's not going to limit our authority. It's not going to expand our authority. Okay. And so it's just somebody put police in there and they should have put law enforcement officer. That's what it boils down to. And and and, and then clarify the, the the problems. You know, we are there's something that y'all are aware of the Dillon rule. You guys, how many how many criminal statutes do you have in the books? Do you know? I don't have it, the number memorized. The main reason you have criminal statutes at the local level so the localities can keep the revenue. 
And so that's why they enact these statutes, and so the localities can keep the revenue. And so, you know, what you're doing is, if, if you think you're stopping the, the police officers from identifying and making arrests, you're reducing your revenues. And so that's the purpose behind these code sections, is not to protect people's rights or anything, it's to raise the revenues for the localities. You, they can always charge under the state codes, because there's a state code for every local code. You guys don't have the authority to pass criminal bills that aren't passed at the state level. And so I think that, you know, you have to understand that to understand why this is just a, a paper shuffle to try and change the name, change from a police officer, Virginia Beach police officer, to a law enforcement officer, because I think, you know, that's, that's just smart. You don't, want, you don't want people construing this to be a misappropriation like you all have done. You, and I don't say that to insult you all, but I think you have misunderstood this bill, and, and the purpose of this bill is just to clean up some stuff right now. And so if you guys don't want to pass it, done, there's no skin off my back. I, I, it's not, not going to hurt me at all. It just need, we just need to clean up the code. You know, Ken, I think, uh, you know, the thing is that we're looking for is to get the yes on this. And, you know, it just may be, a, you know, a short deferral just may be in order for clarification points. But I think we're, we're, we're let's get the yes. All right. Well, I'd like to end with this. I think that this council has been very supportive of, of the sheriff's office, and I hope you continue to be supportive of us tonight. And so I'll, I'll speak more on that issue later on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Moss. Just this is the, I don't know how many budgets I've sat through, but at least 20, I think. <laughs> this is the first time I've ever heard that the reason why we have two training academies is because of just a difference of leadership. On So to me, if we have capacity problems and we are running a sheriff's academy and they're staffing that, mm -hmm. we're running a police academy and staffing that, what can we do if we had everybody just being trained to the same standard and then we could have sheriffs going to our traditional police academy when they're recruiting we could and we could have greater production and throughput by having uniformity maybe even offset the start dates so that we're having one every quarter versus I mean I that's the first I've ever heard that that was a, an internal leadership uh, issue versus thinking of the greater good so I hope that as we're looking at this, as we come forward in the budget process, we could look at what if we expanded theirs to match and we had them offset on start dates so that we could increase the total production to meet the demands of both departments would make sense to me. And it shouldn't be a real resource because they're already staffing police academies. You're talking about the duration of the staffing. So I hope they take that into consideration because we do need to increase our ability to for throughput and more academies would create less delay when people start and when they get hired. Because I do know an issue has been people get, but it takes them so long to start the academy, they get another job and someone we thought we had, we lost. So if we can shorten that time between the offer and the start and the pay, then we can get maybe a higher return on the initial process. I just a thought, but it's the first time, and thank you, Sheriff Stilley, for bringing it up. It's the first time I've ever heard that. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Um, First of all, I'm really so happy that our police and sheriff's departments work so closely together. And I really would like to support the sheriff tonight. I think it's what he's already doing. This doesn't really change anything. Uh, I, I don't understand why there's such confusion here. And I think, I think Mark, our attorney, explained it well, and I think the sheriff did. So I personally would like to support the sheriff tonight. Okay, at this point, we have a um, substitute motion for the, to defer. Is there any time limit on the deferral, Mr. Moss? I just think it ought to be tied for when they can bring forward the memorandum of agreement. I think that's what we ought to have. I realize we're not going to resolve the accountability issue, so I'm not going to hold it up for that. That's just a risk we're going to take and have to explain to the public. But I think we really ought to see the memorandum of agreement before we move forward. That's just my view. but. It's not a question if there's a right or wrong answer. It's just what individual command council members are comfortable with, and I don't have any pejorative characterizations of anybody's vote. Okay, uh, let's get to yes on this. Okay, anybody else? The vote is open. To Mayor, would I say an indefinite deferral? Uh, at this point, yeah. When, when we, once we get the yeah, but let's try to get it expedited. Okay. I like yeah. dates. Dates force is a forcing function. Let, and I don't, we'll I, don't, I don't know the details. I'd like to have the sheriff tell me what he thinks because he's working with the police chief. That's the reasonable answer. Issues don't arise until the summertime when we have to go down there to 
be a force multiplier. And so I think if you have this done before the summertime, that'll be fine. But again, it's not going to change the way that we do anything, but I think it just clears up the code. Yep. Do you think you and the chief in less than 60 days can have that? Yeah. I think it sounds like the answer yeah, we'll is yes. I say 60 days. Dates okay. are important. 60 days. Like, like okay. Thank you. Referrals. All righty. So would that be, uh, sorry, on March 1st? Okay. There we go. Okay. So by a vote of 6 to 4, uh, you've deferred this to March 1st. No. You've nope. adopted okay. the substitute motion. Now you have to oh, vote I'm, on the I'm substitute sorry. motion. Okay. Now we vote on the, the main motion. Okay. The main motion is to approve. No. No, the okay. main motion to is to, to defer to March Oh, wait a minute. The, the, the deferral? Okay. You know, forgive me. My medications are letting me down. Uh, okay. Uh, no, uh, the motion is to defer. To March 1st. To March 1st. Okay. okay, by a vote of 7 to 3 with Mr. Holcomb abstaining, you've uh, deferred this to March 1st. Okay, thank you. We will get to yes. Okay, thank you all. All right, moving on. Uh, ordinance to authorize um, longevity and college initiatives for the sworn employees of the Sheriff's Office and transfer up to 570000 from vacancy savings within the general fund to the Sheriff's Special Revenue Fund. Move for approval. So right. we have speakers speak. first. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay, speakers. The first speaker is Barbara Mesner, and then the second speaker will be Max Ganano. Mr. Mayor, I'll yes. be abstaining again, and I have a letter on file. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, which item? I-5. Ordinance 5? Okay. Authorize longevity and college incentives for sworn employees. Um, I just think it's important to note with all that discussion that what um, Mr. Moss brought up was that we didn't have advance notice and this wasn't discussed. That That is huge. You know, it, it isn't just what's going on. It's, it's the due process. But um, there's so many incentives for city employees, uh, select city employees, and I appreciate the fact that the sheriffs and the police support each other, but the sheriffs are also used for special events, and y'all go out of your way to mention Town Center and the Oceanfront. They also take care of the vibe in anywhere that alcohol is sold, and you keep expanding where alcohol is sold, and that takes a lot of time uh, for the sheriffs who have other duties. Um, <clears throat> So this uh, special revenue fund, which Mr. Moss, you know, helps explain, um, it's not 570,000, uh, you know, savings account. It's like, where does all this money come from? And why, we have another budget coming up, and you haven't even, you know, managed uh, the budget that you have every year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Max Ganano and then Melissa Lukeson. Good evening, Max. Good evening, Mayor. Good to see you up there. Uh, it's good to be seen. I know the feeling. Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, ladies and gentlemen of City Council. My name is Max Ganano and I represent the Virginia Beach Professional Firefighters and EMS Providers. I would like to voice my full support for Sheriff Stolley's proposal to authorize longevity and educational incentive pay for the Sheriff's Office if Council amends this to include fire and EMS as part of that implementation. If not, we request deferral until that can be presented to Council in whole. As far as not knowing how much it would cost to add fire and EMS, 
It was $1.1 million for PD to do it as part of the budget last year. Fire and EMS are roughly two-thirds the size of PD, so that would be your rough estimate. Fire, EMS, and police have had pay parity for decades. Several years ago, the Sheriff's Office was added to this, a move that we supported and continue to support, and one that was overwhelmingly supported by you, City Council. After that, Council implemented the Workforce Development Career Progression Plan across all of sworn public safety, which we supported also. Now, this proposal does not include fire and EMS. My question is, since when did fire and EMS not matter as much as law enforcement, and since when did we not have pay parity? <coughs> In 2021, the police department had over 50% more applicants than fire did. And the written test, test passage rate for fire was around 50%. Because of this, the fire department is having issues hiring enough candidates. Not including all of public safety will make this worse and will only tell potential candidates to go somewhere else where they will be treated equally. This drop in candidates has caused the fire department to under hire. The fire department was recently authorized to hire 60 personnel. As a result of these issues, around 20 of those 60 authorized slots were not filled by the hiring process. This will likely result in the delay of the Burton Station Ladder Company going in service. As a result of the vacancies we currently have, there are over 700 hours of mandatory overtime every single month. If we want to talk about pay parity, let's talk about how firefighters have to work 40% more hours than anyone else to make the same base salary. That's 2,912 hours of scheduled shifts compared to everyone else's 2,080. The message you send by not including fire is 40% more work for less money. Lastly, the City of Chesapeake recently implemented a public safety step plan that was equal across all of public safety. Not treating fire and EMS equally will only tell those in the limited applicant pool both cities are competing for to choose Chesapeake over Virginia Beach. This will only compound our issues. I have spoken with many of you about this, and some of you made commitments. And I trusted you. Thank you. Thanks. Melissa Lukeson, and then Sheriff Stolly. Oh, welcome back. Well, hello. Okay, everybody's just so sensitive these days. Um, I, sorry, Aaron, I might have, I, Mr. Berlucci, was not disparaging and also made it very clear my support of the Sheriff's Department as well, but I feel like you kind of got thrown under the bus when I was a citizen that also said that. So I just wanted to clear that up. I am not disparaging the Sheriff's Department or Mr. Stolle and his job, okay? Um, I am concerned about this kind of money, half a million dollars going to um, the Sheriff's Department when as we have a lot of representation from our city fire department where there is pay parity as, as they have now shared. Um, one of the things I wanna talk about with the pay parity is there was the 2019 study, obviously that we did the pay parity study. Seems that things have equaled out, but Mr. Stolle thinks that it should be equal. So everything VBPD gets, they should get. Well, fire should get. Shouldn't just be the sheriff's office. Training does not equal competency or experience. Just to kind of address from the other issue and speaking about the training issue with the sheriff's deputies, my father was a deputy. I've stood up here and told you this before. My father was incredibly, not only was he trained, but he was an instructor, okay, in Ohio, in universities. So. I understand the training for sheriffs, okay? But it's different. They work with the community in a different way. Also, in the career path of a police officer, the career path of a police officer for expanding their education is really, really important for them. You're talking about investigation. There's so many departments in the police department that the sheriff's office does not have that would encourage longevity and incentives for education and increasing education for master's degrees and doctorals and things like that. Um, I just think that, that that should be considered. Um, what happens, have we considered what happens if they get the money for the education but no one gets educated? Does the money come back to the city? What, what happens to those funds? Um, and just to kind of finish it off, why does the Sheriff's Department need retention bonuses as in their fringe benefits package as well um, when they terminate appointments of really good deputies that have been working for the department for 15 years? Have a great night. Thanks a bunch. Sheriff Stolle. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you very, 
Very nice. This time I have to disagree with one of the council members, as John Moss, on, on his position on this bill. But I think that this, John's trying to, uh, Councilman Moss is trying to have this set up to go to a comp, uh, compensation study, I think. We have directed and one is due to be delivered in January and get them to council in February. The, the study is already in place and going to be delivered this month to the city manager and to council next month. But this is not about compensation. This is about equity. Well, it's about total compensation. Well, but the, the decision that this council made back in 19 or 2018 was that we were going to treat the firefighters, the police officers, and, and the deputy sheriffs the same, that they all have different jobs. We train for our jobs. We all have different jobs. And the decision was made to treat us all the same, not separately. This has nothing to do with compensation. You all study the compensation of law enforcement officers or public safety officers, and I think you, you can come to your own conclusion on, or the study can rec make recommendations on that. The decision that you all made <coughs> two or three years ago was that all law enforcement officers, all public safety officers should be treated the same. And that's that's what I'm trying to achieve here tonight. And I, I you know, and Mark and I might, the city attorney and I may disagree on how this works, but I think the statute complements which which you all did to the police department. I think you, you all gave incentives to the police department through the budget, not through the code, not through the or city ordinances, but through the budget, which you have the authority to do. I'm not disputing that. But I think that the, the if you take a look at the resolution that you all passed, uh, in, in April of 19, uh, 2018, you go into here and you talk about, um, let me find it here, you, uh, it goes in the resolution and it says, to do a proper study of pay disparities, such studies must take into account the total compensation available to the employee and for the purpose of this ordinance, total compensation shall mean all salaries, French benefits, and let me go back and re reinforce that. It says, for the purposes of this ordinance that is, was passed, that you guys were going to pass, or hopefully pass and did pass, for the purpose of this ordinance, total compensation shall mean all salaries and fringe benefits available to the employee, including such benefits that are generally de uh, designated as incentives. And so this is, you all pass an incentive for them, a longevity incentive and an educational incentive. And so I think what happens is the next thing in the resolution reads, as of July 1st, 2019, the Virginia Beach Sheriff's Office shall, shall be on the same pay plan as the Virginia Beach Police Department. Such hiring pay is the same. The, range, the pay ranges are the same, and the pay increases are the same. And so I think that's the position that you took in, in, in 2018, and it's a position I hope you maintain today. I think I think you all led. To, you were one of the first cities in the, in the state to, to adopt a pay parity thing, and it and it flew throughout the state. And a number of jurisdictions have now followed what Virginia Beach did. And I hope you're not going to reverse you, reverse yourself now and say well, it was our position two years ago that you all were important enough to include you in parity. And, and and you know I I agree with the fire department. I think a number of things have gone wrong, and I think that incentive thing has broken up the parity. And so you know it, it, I, I I'd hope you'd pass this, and I'd be happy to respond. To any questions that you all have, but I think that you know I'd also like to offer an amendment to this if you all would have, listen yeah, to the amendment. A question, Ms. I have a Wilson. question of the city manager. Ken, thank you so much. Um, so, fire and EMS have they've raised a really good point about you know that they're left out as well. Do we have a handle on what it would cost to include them? Uh, at the time last year, when council ad adopted this. Um, college incentive and longevity pay it was only specifically for the police department um, we did not look into what it would cost to do it for fired EMS longevity pay is a easy or ask to look for because we that's easy to calculate the difficulty is in college pay since um, most of the ranks in the fire and EMS um, department does not require college degrees we don't track that so we would have to reach out individually to the different units for them to reach out to the men and women and the sworn staff to identify how many folks have college degrees and then we'll need to get that and then calculate that we did not want to go down that process unless council actually wanted us to because that'll set an expectation amongst the men and women there but if that's something the that council wants us to look into we're, we're more than happy to have our HR staff reach out to the fire and EMS um, department and get that information and pre present so, it to council. So I want to support the sheriff tonight, but I think we also need to look at the promises that we've made for treating 
all of our public safety equally. And so can you get back with us on that information and we can make a decision from that point? Understood. I can get that information for council. And also I'll include, I'm, gonna, I'm assuming you're asking for this as well, what longevity pay would look like for the fire and EMS department in addition to the college incentive as well. Okay, Ms. Henley. Uh, in this uh, transmittal letter that we have in our agenda package, yes, it says that you briefed us August 17th uh, and that you said you would attempt to manage the cost of education and longevity within your existing appropriations. Yes, ma'am. Uh, but that you might need additional funding, and that's what you're back now to get additional funding. I, I think what's happened is that the VRS has said that you have to fund out, 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 of, out of the permanent re resource, out of the general fund, any any pay increases that go into VRS calculation. So they don't want one-time fund being used for that. So I'm here saying that I, I, will, I will pay the remainder of this year if you all need me to, but I think for this to pass, it's got to pass with the city's approval to come from the general fund. I was just wondering, since you said in August you were going to be looking at it, so you have looked at it, and yes, this is what you, so you haven't instituted it yet, but you have just come up with this finding right. that VRS is requiring that yeah. we make it a. Yeah, we, we had some discussion with the city manager's office about it, uh, making this happen, but we decided to hold off until when council started expressing some concern about it. So we've held off on it now. Well, I, I think clearly, you know, this was brought to us back in August when we had done it with the police, and I think we kind of gave the nod that this was what we would be thinking about doing. So and, it's and, just that now and, you need to have it as a permanent thing. I, I, think, I, think, I think the law requires this. I think, it, it, I think the ordinance that you all passed require that you all do this. And so now I know that there's some discussion about subject to appropriations, but this, this is, this, I'd argue the code here, and Mark's going to disagree with me on this, <laughs> but uh, the, the code says that, uh, you know, I'll read you the statute. It says there's two sections to the, to the ordinance that come out. The first one is, as of July 1st, 2019, the VBSO shall be on the same pay plan as the Virginia Beach Police Department, such, hi such that hiring pay is the same, the pay ranges are the same, and the pay increases this are the same. Uh, that this uh, provided that the study finds that there is uh, that the jobs are comparable and, and, and they found that the jobs were comparable so this goes into effect July 1st that went into effect July 1st you, with no action on your part and so I think that that goes into effect again now in the second paragraph which deals with the disparity between the salaries it goes on and, and we have some we have more, at least one attorney uh, extra attorney on council and, and so we, we, we can get an opinion from him as well the guy on the spot <laughs> But it can says find an attorney that will agree with you. Yeah, uh, they don't agree with me, but <laughs> yeah. If the study identifies a pay disparity between the total compensation for employees of the Virginia Beach Sheriff's Office and the Virginia Beach Police Department, the City Council desires that the closing of such pay disparity wishes to occur subject to annual appropriations, which is what I think John's talking about, annual appropriations of sufficient funds by council over a period of four years, each fiscal year addressing 25% of the such disparity. Once the pay parity is achieved, the council desires it to be maintained thereafter. Now, it, and statutory construction, I've got some small acquaint, acquaintance with statutory construction, but statutory construction says if you say something in one place and don't say it in the other place, you don't mean it. And so Section 4 d talks about annual appropriation. Section 3 does not. And so Section 4 deals with the disparity, and Section 3 deals with the pay increases in the pay plan and stuff like that. So I'd say that by the, by the wording of this document that you do not have you know, the, the appropriation authority on this, that you have to reserve appropriation authority. And I know the budget, a lot of arguments say that the budget starts off, the budget has to reserve that, that the budget overrides all general law. I'd say two things. This is specific law. It's not general law. This qualifies as specific law because it's directed at one organization. And I'd also say that, that the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the plan that, that was put forward is, is the language in here dictates that it, that it only applies to the the uh, uh, the second the, the fourth paragraph, not the third paragraph. And and finally, I'd say that in construction, uh, under under statutory construction, you can't you can't you can't insert something. And I looked at your budget today, and and the, the, the state budget always starts off with a preamble that notwithstanding any other law, this is going to be the law. And your budget doesn't do that. And so I don't think you reserve the right to have your budget override general law here. 
Well, Mr. Mayor, can we reclaim the floor for the council discussion? Yeah. Well, Thank you. Yeah, okay. uh, I, I just feel like, you know, we did look at this back in August and, and gave a, a nod, I think, at that particular time. So I think we want to make good on that All right. intent. But I, I think now that we've had the issue about fire and EMS raised, I do think that's something we need to look into. Mm. And I, I really appreciate the concern that the fire department has now for staffing and I'm assuming ENF, EMS probably has a similar concern. Uh, and I do recognize that we've got this market study coming on, but I also recognize that we need to be hiring now to be able to get these people trained and so we don't have the same issues that maybe we might have in general. But I think we have indicated in the past that we expect to have Right. parity for all of our public safety and so I think that's just in keeping with what we have done before and I I think we may, need to move forward and get that data and move forward there as well so thank you for yeah. bringing it forward. I don't want to exceed my welcome here but I, I'd say I can fix the problem for you we used to do it up in Richmond all the time and that's send us you, money yeah it, well it's money but <laughs> but you can say you can limit this the appropriation on this you can say this includes fire and EMS and and uh, out of such funds not to exceed the same amount of money that you appropriate for the police department yeah but and we've always kind of said we have to determine what might where the money's coming from so yeah, we yeah. might need a few more days to do that was there a second uh, okay motion Aaron we can, there, okay I'm there, sorry there isn't a motion yet I know there's a there was a motion I thought you made a motion sorry, but no one seconded it. I thought you said you moved to approve I thought but no one second, did yeah. a second. I moved to approve yeah, I didn't I hear a second a I was just trying to second. get back into okay. regular business you know, uh, let's see if we can right. get the uh, you know the uh, vote on that Okay. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Aaron. I, I don't have a. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry about that. I don't have a comment or just, or about the the ordinance per se. I, and in fact, I would support the ordinance, but I have uh, concerns about the process. And this has nothing to do with the sheriff's office. That's more so to do about this body. Just before Christmas break, um, we had opportunity to provide tax breaks for small businesses and for our people of our city. And you all said, this body said, majority of the body, not everyone, said, no, we're not going to do this because it, it gets out of the budget cycle. But now we're talking about appropriation for the sheriff's department. No, just no regard right, to the right, sheriff's right. department. But we're talking about appropriation for the sheriff's department as well as EMS and fire. But also we should be talking about it for our staff as well, human services, city workers, our, our staff as well. We should be talking about that. And we're, we're out of cycle with the budget. So... One of the comments I believe Vice Mayor just made is, or Miss Miss Henley was, where we're we going to get the money from, and so in appropriations, all these are budgetary items. Again, I'm not opposed to this. I just don't know where. I see where we're getting this money, but we have to talk about where we're going to get money. Provide if we take the route for a fire department, for EMS, for human services workers. Those are all budgetary guidance issues, and we are out of cycle with that. So the process again, to me, I don't know how we do things here. And I've been here four years. The process is just some things go, some things don't go. Again, I, I, I'm not understanding okay. where we are in this process. Again, let me get the one word. My apologies. Well, thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, and I look forward to that information the Vice Mayor requested also. But, Ken, I just wanted to take the opportunity to tell you you run a great department. Oh, and you. your working together with Chief Newdigate has made a marked difference in how we police, uh, particularly at the oceanfront. And I have seen that firsthand. I just want to thank you, well, thank you for your cooperation because it makes a big difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Ms. Wilson and then Mr. Belucci. Um, and I just wanted to, a couple things. First, this should have been part of the budget and it was left out. Right. So this is sort of playing cleanup of what we That's right. messed up on when we did the budget. And we should have had this in there. So right. that's that's what makes this a little bit different All right and secondly with the motion that i made and and i thought i'd like to add on that that the staff is to come back with us with numbers for fire and ems for the same parity with the uh second the person that made the second if you would agree to that i did okay i would so. okay All right. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'd like to make a substitute motion. Okay, uh, but I, hang on, uh, hang on. We, we got we got a process here. Yeah, uh, uh, Mr. Moss. <laughs> oh, I'll yield to Mr. Belushi first. I think he was before me. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Moss. Well, I just want to take a minute, just a quick minute, to acknowledge the um, men and women from the fire department and EMS services who are here. And I see there are a lot of you here. 
I don't see any women, but there could be. I apologize if I don't see you, but, but men and also obviously the men and women from the sheriff's office and all public safety generally. Um, I want to support the sheriff's office request here, and, and I plan to, but I want to make exceedingly clear my position to fire an EMS that I don't have the numbers, but based on the scale that, that I can extrapolate from the sheriff's request and the police officer's request, um, I want to express to you my personal position, which is that I support including fire and EMS in this program as well. And I think that um, my request to council is that we do it as quickly as we as possible as we possibly can. We just need the information. So with respect to Mr. Ganano's request, and I do take it seriously, I'm comfortable to support um, the request tonight, but also move proactively to um, to make the um, program extend to fire in EMS as well. And also, I just want to state, you know, my reflections for the record. We've got an incredible public safety infrastructure personnel team training all across the board in Virginia Beach and one of the this is not hyperbole this is honestly how I feel I've been here for three years and one of the great privileges that co has come with this job is to have a front row seat and learn about what men and women who serve not all aspects of our city but particularly public safety I mean I I've watched videos for fire for police and 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 seen it in the sheriff's office too about people who they're literally running into danger. That's that's a, a phrase we often use, but few of us actually consider what that means. And you're not running in to save your family or to save yourself. You're running towards that danger to save people you haven't even met. And it's and I know that the people of Virginia Beach expect this council to support public safety personnel in every aspect. And and I know that because I've run twice and I told them I would do it. And, and I take that responsibility seriously because the people I have the privilege to represent expect me to do that. And I just want to thank you all for being here, and, and I want to thank you all for your service, those who are in this room and everywhere across our city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. At this point, we have a motion. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I, Mr. Moss. Thank you for recognizing oh, me. <laughs> oh, you want to speak, Ms. Summer? You know, I think uh, take a little rundown memory road how we got here. And I don't know about everybody nodding, because I know I wasn't nodding. <laughs> you were the one to vote against it. Well, we didn't vote on that particular issue. The budget was 11-0. But you can certainly sit down. We are moved on. Yeah. If I could, Mr. Mayor, we don't let any other citizens stand at the podium during council discussion. I think he should take his seat. I'll take my seat if the mayor directs me to. No, it was, he was sponsored. But it, it, not, was, it was my call, John. All right. Now, now you said something different. Okay. But, uh, but down memory road, how we got here? during reconciliation budget is when this all happened if you all can remember mr wood is one of his last departing <laughs> benefits put that in and during reconciliation at the time all council members may remember my response to that request i said every person who's a professional in police and fire doesn't have an equal opportunity to pursue getting an education or another degree they could be a single parent they could be taking care of an aging parent their work schedules and their life schedule may not enable them to participate in getting educational degrees. And so therefore, by a system that we set up, by the nature of their environment, they are structurally disenfranchised, structurally disenfranchised from compensation that we claim, but have yet to prove, is tied to retention. I've asked for data after data, never have gotten anything that actually changes. I said, if we have a structural issue about retention, then we should be dealing with retention bonuses and dealing with pay changes and not tying it to some kind of payment over which a person or a department may not have the opportunity to achieve, but yet is still performing. I think I probably have more experience than anyone on this body about national security and people in uniform. If you want to make commander, you got to earn a master's degree. They don't pay you more when you get it. You might get promoted, and that's the reason why you do it. They might help you pay for it, but they don't give you more money because you've earned it. You know, you just do the job and move on. So I don't think educational incentives <clears throat> is the right approach to deal with retention, if that's the purpose. If the purpose is then to get people to acquire education because it's now a requirement, 
then we should have a very robust educational reimbursement program, which the man here I've talked about, we do not have. So I'm, I think all of us should share is what is the output that we want, not the input. And is the input going to generate the output of public safety, which we are now equating to people on board? So I've yet to see anybody, and I, in reconciliation budget, you vote for things you agree with and you vote for things you don't agree with because it's a basket, and I know you understand that. Yeah. But I didn't buy into that the educational incentive payment was the way to deal with the problem of retention. And I still don't believe it's the right approach. And no one suggested or provided any evidence, empirical evidence, that suggests that it makes a material difference in retention. Now, retention bonuses probably make sense. And they're not extensively used both in industry and in the military as well to get people to stay. Or would you get very expensive training, very long-term commitments that you have to repay if you leave, which makes sense. So for after better trained, better retention, then we need to have the structural mechanisms that really have some empirical relationship between the input, the, the program, and the outcome, which is more people on board, more effective, more efficient, more productive workforce. It's like going to the whole big one tra train, one train all approach. But educational incentives doesn't show, and I haven't yet to see, and I've done some research in where it's just a, a mechanism to say something to put money in people's pocket because we think they deserve more money. Well, then give the money for the right reason. Don't dress it up for something that has no effect, but put it into a policy decision that actually has a material impact that you're trying to achieve. And that is why I didn't like it before. And parity. You think in the Navy we train nuclear reactor operators are all on the same ship, right? They all can go down with the ship, but does everybody on the ship pay the same? No. Do they all have the same risk to go down with the ship? Yes. But real life makes distinctions. Real life is about, and that's why the compensation, maybe it's something different you need for fire that you don't need for police. I don't know, but, we, but to say one shoe fits all, that never works anywhere in the world that I live in. The world makes discriminating differences. And then if you say, well, we don't want to just want to make them, well, that's another story. But I do agree with the city attorney, when it, and Congress said, when it comes, you can authorize all you want, but if no one appropriates any money, nothing happens. But I do believe educational incentives is not the right approach to the problem that we're defining, which is retention and recruitment, is not the right approach. And that's why I think the wage and salary study that is coming, which is total compensation, which is leave, which is how much you pay for health insurance, which is time off, all those things, and say, how competitive are we and where do you make a difference to have a competitive advantage? You might not want to compete on leave. You might not want to compete on health insurance. You might want to compete on direct salary in people's pockets. Mr. But, Moss, could we come to a well, conclusion? We can, but I think this is an important item. And I, and I want the it, public to understand, because this looks like, oh, if you don't vote for this, then you're against public safety. I'm for public safety output. And I do not see, and no evidence has been provided to show, and Mr. Rouse was right about process. When we want to give money to taxpayers, it's woe is me, it's a long, we don't have the money, where's it going to come from? There's a thousand reasons we can't act. And then when it's time to give the taxpayers money away where there's no correlation between the output and the input, we can do it on the spot. I don't understand it. I want the public to understand it. I'm for solutions. But this is not a solution to the problem that's been identified. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, at this point, uh, Ms. Henley. If I could just make one one brief comment because this whole thing of process did come up, and I think the difference between whether or not we were going to give um, tax breaks for the next coming year and so forth, and this or are, are, can be compared, I don't really think they can. I think we are looking at filling the positions that are in this year's budget. And I think it's extremely important uh, for uh, these departments, fire and EMS, to make sure they're able to fill the positions that are now vacant and being able to hire people. It's, it, it's an immediate concern because they're getting 
far fewer applications than they have in the past, and we have got a lot of vacancies. And it's not a matter of, well, it'll just take a few days longer to get that work out if some of our other departments don't have positions filled. These positions have got to be filled every day, every hour. And there's got to be somebody in there. And they're paying a lot of money now in overtime right. because they don't have these positions. And so these are positions within this year's budget that we're trying to fill. And unfortunately, it takes a training time, so it takes a while to get everybody up. But we really can't wait. And I think it's important that we send this message now so that people will apply, that we're going to be treating our folks uh, right, and that, that this is where they need to come to, to work. And, and it is an immediate thing. It's not a next year's budget thing. It's a right now that this is a need in these departments. And so I think we need to act as soon as we possibly can to send this message. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Ms. Wilkin. Oh, I agree. Um, I think we should definitely act now. And I would like to act now and include the EMS and the fire department. So I, I, I will want to support this. Uh, I see, and it's been no coincidence, I've seen ad after ad for EMS recruiting and the fire department recruiting. I've never seen that before. And so this would also be an incentive to help them while they're actively in recruiting to bring those qualified candidates to make sure they're up to staff and up to par. Uh, and so I think, I agree, the time is now. I think it's uh, poignant that we also consider them and we can do it. We just need to make the amendment and include them. Okay, I believe uh, that was made with the, the motion that was to include I, I fire and the EMS. Really so so I thought I heard that we would consider and try to do it as soon as possible. Well, we need for the manager to, to get all the data the together so we know how much money it is so that we can appropriate it. But to it. proceed with, you know, as we go into the budget process. So they are going to be included in tonight. They're going to be bringing us the numbers as soon as they can so then we can make the allocation. So what's the deadline to? As soon as they can. Can we put a deadline yeah, on it? Mr. Dehaney? Ms. Wooten, we're, we're going to be going into a budget cycle very, very shortly. I, I just want to make sure we're doing it uh, as expeditiously I, I, I as possible. I give you my personal guarantee okay. that we will be looking at firing a mess. And I'll be honest with you, I would include 911, too. You know, they got some yeah. problems well, over there, well, too. Well, let's do that. In terms of, you know, recruitment and retention. <laughs> but, you know, we, can we we're, do that, too? Of course. Once again, let's, let's get the it, yes. Okay. All right. May uh, I ask a question? Yeah, please. Madam Clerk, do you have that information written down? The motion? Yes. I, I, I mean, we've written down what, what's going to be required to come forward, but for right now, the motion is to approve this ordinance. It's, it's, it's to approve, no, it's to approve the ordinance, but also for the city manager to come back with the information on fire and EMS. So it'll be approved as amended. Right. And we would have to know the numbers in order to make the allocation. You can't make an allocation if you don't know how much it's going to be. But, yeah. but the, the understanding, Mr. City Manager, is that so, you're going to come back and let us know what that would be. So what I got the last time was um, come back with information on longevity and college incentive for fire and EMS. I'm hearing right now that that may also include the uh, 911 department. I think we should look into that. Do you want me to that, amend though. it a second time and include 911? I, I, I got it. I think I got it. I think I got it. Fire EMS and 911. Okay, thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. Mr. Reps. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, not to, to belabor the point any, any further. Um, and it's something I, I can't support as well. But also, I just want to, you know, remind everyone, we just got a, a, a report back about the vacancies throughout our city staff and so if if we're you know i think that's something we should look at as well city managers how can we provide a, a robust plan for um not only college uh, but longevity pay as well to attract uh city staff i mean you talk about you know parks and rec who cut cut all the grass throughout our city public works public utilities public utilities we need 
uh, a robust plan as well to, to make sure we're looking out for them because they also help and work hand in hand with our first responders to keep our city going and keep it open. So um, I would like if, if you can get numbers back on that so we can make sure we have that by the budget process. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I'm sure then we got the market survey coming and everything. A bit, how about vote is open? By a vote of nine to one, with Mr. Holcomb uh, absent because he abstained, you've approved this as amended. Okay, thank you all very much. And the final item in the regular session here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Oh, thank you very thank much. Thank you all. Okay. The ordinance to transfer $32,260 from vacancy mm -hmm. savings to general fund to the fiscal year 2021-22 Commissioner of Revenue um, Operating Budget and Approved Pay Range Increases to Deputy and Chief Position Series. Okay. Um, Money for everybody. A anybody? We have one speaker, Mayor uh, Barbara Mesner. Oh. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I'm going to ask the, uh, if the Commissioner can come forward after Ms. Messer. Eight C. Under um, we're still under ordinances. Yeah, eight C. The, the last one on the page. Okay, and Mr. Rouse, thank you for. Telling them about due process, Mr. Moss. Thank you for, you know, I can't believe you vote on, on something without information. Uh, you know that last vote. You know, this this city is an absolute mess. Okay, H C. Yes. Okay, thirty two, thirty three thousand, thirty two thousand two hundred and sixty from vacancy savings. You're saving money, you know. When you don't have employees in the general fund, 2122, Commission of Revenue, I just saw Keller machine pop up. Um, approve pay range increases for the deputy and chief deputy positions requested by the Commissioner of the Revenue and the city treasurer. Um, you know, so many people aren't even coming to work. Uh, they're working from home. And, you know, everything should wait until the budget. And, you know, a lot of people don't even know there was a meeting today, let alone uh, read this or want to come. There's other things going on. So uh, I hope you will continue to pay attention to the lack of due process and City attorney works for the city. He gives his opinion. The legal rulings are from uh, the Commonwealth attorney. Thank you. Thank you. It's only speaker mayor. Okay, uh, Mr. Tower, did you want to? Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, is the commissioner, yeah, there he is. Mr. Kellum could come give us a briefing on this. Mr. Mayor, it's very nice to see you, sir. Don't want to keep you here any longer than necessary and not long at all. That's my hope. Um, this particular issue, Lee, you want to come on up? Uh, we're not, we're talking about $32,000 and change. Um, I have this money in my operating budget. I. I will certainly have it in vacancy savings, if not in my operating budget as savings by the end of this fiscal year. We are seeking parity, parity with the real estate assessor, which has a much narrower scope of responsibility as opposed to the treasurer's responsibilities as, a, as well as the commissioner's responsibilities. And we are seeking two pay grade increases for our chief uh, assistants, chief deputies in the treasurer's office as well as the commissioner's office, and 
air management team, air deputies. I have five. How many do you have, five. Lee? Five as well. And this is the leadership team in <coughs> comparing these positions to the leadership team in the real estate assessor's office. We are at two pay ranges below them. Now, there's been much talk about a market survey and a market study. You'll find when you compare us to Norfolk, Chesterfield County, other localities in Hampton Roads as well, that you will find that these positions are far lower on the pay scale. But we're not asking to deal with that. We're just seeking simple parity. Now, Lee can speak to her own budget, but I think 32000 what is it, $32,620, $260 uh, is, is all I'm asking. And I really don't know why we are here today. We have a history of not having to put this kind of an information before council. But for some reason, the um, Department of Human Resources has consulted with the uh, city manager and said that this is an issue for council. $32,260. Again, market survey is immaterial here. We're talking about parity. The last point I would like to make, you've had three constitutional officers appear before you tonight seeking parity, parity with other city agencies and departments. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dehaney? Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, I just wanted to articulate the reason why um, the Commissioner of Revenue's office and the City Treasurer's office is here is because I think the Commissioner of Revenue's office, budget-wise, did not look like it could support the appropriation that Council previously approved. So this is why we brought it back to Council, similar to what happened with the Sheriff previously, is that it didn't look like the appropriation in place would have supported that. So it needed to come back to Council for Council to determine if it was willing to appropriate additional funds to, in order for them to meet their budget. Okay, Ms. Henley. I just have a confused question. Yes, ma'am. All right, your offices generally are funded by the state, partially by the state. Your salaries are determined by the state. Is that correct? No. Um, our, our offices are funded both by the state and the city. In fact, my office is receives about 17% of its funding from the state and 83% from the city. For that funding of over 200, excuse me, $402 million in assessments, the state funds 16% of it and gets 2% of the revenue. The city funds 83% of it and gets 98% of the revenue. So it's, Pretty good deal there for the yeah, city. Yeah, that's because it's real estate, and that's our source of income, and so I don't, forth. I don't and, handle and businesses real estate. and so forth. I don't I, handle I thought, real estate. I but thought y'all were. If you can let Miss Henley talk. I thought oh, y'all yeah, were. Um, I thought your salaries were. Don't don't. Isn't there some state group agency that sets the? There job is. To deal and with? How how does that work? I mean. The compensation board. Yes. They they look at workload measures and. We adjust those workload measures annually, and the, the state budgets us. In fact, um, we'll be looking at the state budget. I'll be going to Richmond to address issues on that for my association in the next month, next two months, in fact. And um, they do pay some of my salary. They pay my salary and some of the other salaries in the office, as do you guys. But return on investment is much higher for the city, <coughs> much. I, I'm just confused about the, which portions are, the, are state employees in your offices and which ones are city employees. Are they cons all considered city employees? No, ma'am. They're, <laughs> That's they're considered me. employees of the Commissioner of the Revenue under the city pay plan. And that's exactly what we're trying to deal with here. And we've dealt with, we have a history of dealing with it. Yeah. You have, may, may I add, please? Thank you all so much for your time. Although uh, my office specifically has the funds to absorb these changes during this fiscal year, we made this uh, joint effort together 
to recognize the efforts of our management staff who really are the soul of the operations in our office. They support our citizens day to day. And the requirements for those interactions have gotten greater and greater as we have implemented different types of collections or assessments and different types of uh, software systems in our office, the requirement for that. So as we talk about retention tonight, I think this is imperative to consider in our offices for, for retention. As far as funding is concerned, as Phil indicated, that both uh, Treasurer's Association and Commissioner of the Revenues Association are lobbying up in Richmond. I'll be up there for a few days in January to ask the, uh, the governor to um, increase the amount of money that the Compensation Board provides to the um, Treasurer's and Associations based, based on those workload measures. There have been uh, cuts in the state budget for underfunded and unfunded positions in all of the constitutional offices, and that's what we're lobbying for with any surplus funds this year. So to kind of answer your question in a little more detail, some of our positions, uh, the constitutional offices themselves, officers, are funded by the state, and the comp board determines their salaries. However, the city augments and adds to positions within our offices. So some of our employees are paid a portion by the state and then augmented by the city. And then we have other um, positions in our office that are solely paid for by the city, even though we're a constitutional office. We go back and uh, determine, based on those workload measures and the amount of funds that are allotted to us from the compensation board, on how much we can request to the state to reimburse us for those. And that's a determinant in our budget. If I could ask the city manager, will these positions, are they a part of our market survey, or were they left out because they were not city positions? Council, um, Council Mr. Mayor, to Council Member Henley, all the city classifications, every city job, every city classification will be including in the market salary survey. The initial request from talking to the HR staff when the Commissioner of Revenue and the um, city treasurer came to them was the acts, we requested that they wait for the market salary survey to get this information and we can take it as part of the whole holistic package that is presented to council. Um, that timeline was not um, desirable for the Commissioner of Revenue and the City Treasurer, so this is why they're making this request here right now because they feel like they have a, a urgent need within their staff to address these issues now rather than wait for the market All of our survey. staff, as Mr. Ralph said, is urgent. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Again, it's just parity. I mean, are there other, so what, what about all your other employees? Are, are they, are they the market are they survey comparable to our, our um, um, the same department that you have, have selected to be your deputies or we are? Well, for instance, um, okay, go ahead. <clears throat> Um, just a little bit about that information. When I became treasurer back in 2019, I noticed a disparity between the uh, lower level <coughs> staff between the commissioner's office and the city treasurer's office. And I was able Sorry, to work. I can't understand you with the mask on. I apologize. Thank you. When I became treasurer back in 2019, I. Uh, addressed an issue where I saw a disparity in the lower level staffing and their grades and their pay classifications between the commissioner and the um, treasurer's office. So I worked with uh, the human resources department to address that issue. Outside of council intervention, um, I had the funds available to address that. I've done that twice since I've become treasurer. And for me, um, this is of a similar nature where we're trying to address similar activities, similar responsibilities, maybe even more so because we handle more than real estate if we're doing just a comparison to the real estate assessor's office, where our offices are much more diversified in software systems and um, interactions with the citizens. Um, that's why we've, we've come to address this more timely now. Okay, Mr. Moss. Of the, well, first of all, I wish the human resources person was here because when people make statements of parity, it's obviously not an unbiased evaluation. It's just your judgment. And and that there's a whole methodology and a science to doing. I, I, no, if you read, there's no empirical analysis of based on occupational task analysis. There's none of that in there. If there is, it's not in that document. That's usually something that people who have expertise and work workflow analysis and do position classification, that kind of thing, which we have. So was that work done? Because 
I don't know. They're asserting parity with the assistant real estate assessor. Maybe that position's overcompensated, so maybe that's where you fix the problem. But have then did someone do an actual occupational task analysis to validate that in fact, because workload doesn't determine pay, scope, responsibilities, and discretionary authority is where competence and expertise to exercise that, not the amount of work that you do. So did right. our HR department actually take the positions of all those three things and do an occupational task analysis so if someone independently could say, is there an issue? That That is the normal process. I, I, don't, I don't think that happened in this situation <clears throat> here. Cause, oh, I, yeah. Probably not, because it certainly wasn't in the information that I got, so that's just one thing. Um, but are all the 10 positions, are they all uh, state compensation board approved positions or any of those five? Uh, on each side are, are I can say some are 100% funded. How many are any of those positions all state compensation board authorized FTEs? I will speak for my office, but I believe it is probably true for Mr. Kellum's office that they are partially funded, these particular positions. And, and can you share with us what that state compensation approved salary range is for those jobs? I do not have that at time, this time, but I do have the actual funds that we have received in the past. Yeah, I, Well, this is just salary range. This is not occupational task analysis, but I can certainly share well, that. The Commissioner of the Revenue handles an array of taxes where the real estate assessor handles real estate. We have direct public contact through five divisions, five operating divisions, handling state, local taxes. And to just, compare, I, to say that the, the, the scope of work is, is I'm not saying they are or not. I'm just saying we aren't in possession of any independent conducted assessment that tells us that. That's all I'm saying. I'm not taking exception to what you claim. I it's invite you to come into my office next week or this week for a tour. Unsupported by data analysis. Uh, that's all. Now, in the thing, just so people, I did the math. Just we did increase the pay, was it 5% across the board, or is it 4.5, I can't remember now. 4.5%. 4.5%, so the top of the range has already been increased 4.5%, so I assume these people must all be at the top of the range? No, they're not. Okay, well, the reason why I'm asking, because without the benefit of the wage survey yet, since they're not, you're asking for the top of the range to be increased 10.3% for the deputy deputies, if you want to call them that, and 5%. So if we aren't trying to move the salaries of the people because we have retention issues, which is one thing, but we're changing the whole range, which no one's at the top of, then clearly the range adjustment isn't being driven by any short-term sense of urgency. And why should that not be subject to a holistic evaluation as part of the market survey and give the staff the time to really say, validate what you're telling us. Mr. Moss, I respect your, your, your respect for analysis. We're talking about parity here. We're talking about a plain and clear example where there is not parity where there should be. We're also talking about a historic way that this council and prior councils have dealt with this issue and prior city staff has dealt, has this incumbent city staff to some degree and prior city staff have dealt with this. We're talking about $32,620 right now, and you're saying that we need to wait for a market survey when we have clear evidence, excuse me, sir, we have clear evidence that there is more work done, a broader scope of work done in the treasurer's office as well as the commissioner's office than a like-kind office that deals with taxes where their scope is much more narrow. And, and the revenue that is generated is not something that we're worried about. This is, these, these are management leaders in these offices, on, on, in offices that are bringing revenue to you. And they're directly accountable. We're the, we're th we're, you've had three constitutional officers come up here tonight and ask for parity. And that's all we're asking for. And $32,260? My point is I, I, self-defining parity. And we hire a city manager it's to do... Not, no, there's no data in there. You can say that, but that's not in there. I've read that thing several times. It's not there. And I've done occupational task analysis, and I've done comparative wage analysis, so I know of which I speak. My only ask is we hire a city manager, and all I'm asking as the city manager is, I'm asking him to tell me 
not you to tell me that because that's a city position and look at that and have someone who's a professional in the field to objectively provide an assessment. I don't think that's too much to ask. Now, if in fact no one who we're trying to take care of is at the top of the pay scale, then you clearly have the ability. Well, I do have one. Okay, the chief deputies are both okay, at the, okay. my chief deputies the at the top of the pay scale. To work those issues, but one of the issues was is once we adopt all this, is that sustainable in next year's budget based on normal growth, or does it create a deficit? Once again, something I'd like the city manager to tell us. It's less than one percent of the budget. Less than one percent. I'll never forget the Secretary of Defense that said, from pennies come millions. This is the equivalent of 10 people's real estate assessment on their homes. So while you may think it's insignificant, it's not insignificant. The people out there who expect us to be, I'm happy to, to support this when the information is there, but I've learned long ago, you can't ask the people who are asking for the money and say, you're not gonna have some third party validation that says, that's right. You know, it's the self-licking ice cream cone. And you know, and the taxpayers can't really afford that. So that's, my thought is, this is out of the cycle, and I don't see where the big injury to you happens relative to your ability to do your job. And it certainly didn't come through in the agenda item discussion. Well, well Mr. Moss, um, over my 24 year tenure, I've reduced my staff by 24, excuse me, by 17% <coughs> during the same period that the city grew its staff by 32%. My budget grew at a rate of, of a total rate of 52%, while the city's budget, which you've sat, sat on the governing body for many years, has grown at 130%. So I'm not a self-licking ice cream cone. I am a prudent steward of the city's money and the taxpayer's money. And I, I, I understand your respect for analysis, but I think that this is analysis paralysis at 8.29 in the evening over $32,260, and you've got two elected officials here asking you to <coughs> do what you've done in the past and deal with it. Well, We're when not you talking run for re-election, you can go out and tell people you ask them to pay higher taxes to give you $32,000 okay. yeah. more money. Okay, okay let's, uh, thank you. okay, at this point, uh, any other uh, questions, or maybe we get to uh, the vote. Just one question. All right, if this market salary survey shows that the assessors salaries should go either up or down are you prepared to come back and have these salaries go whichever way or are you going to be asking for more if you all you all decide how much money you're going to appropriate we have to make our argument for what is proper and correct I understand that you have professional support that is is implementing that analysis we would abide yes well January we're supposed to be getting this market salary survey it, within the next couple of weeks that's not that's too long to wait you know dr king said wait you know we'll get to it and i am I'm, I'm showing you clear evidence that there is not parity and you've had another constitutional officer up here tonight talking about all we want is parity and i, I just I, I don't understand why we're being run, put through the ringer on 32,000 on money that we know we will have through the end of this year. We both know that. I'm going to make a motion. Okay. All right. Do we have a motion? I do. I move for approval. Second. 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 Okay. Any other discussion? Just want one. I hope one day we can have parity for taxpayers. <laughs> I have a comment as well. Yes, Mr. Rowe. I just want to thank Ms. Henderson and Mr. Kellum for your work. I want to thank your staff as well. Um, I can imagine how tough it's been at, at trying to manage a budget um, throughout this pandemic as well, um, and, and, and making sure you have you have your offices open to um, do the work of the people as well. So I can imagine how challenging that is. And I just want to thank you both um, for the services uh, you provide for our citizens, and thank you for um, your service to our, our, our city. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Thank you. And congratulations on re-election, if I haven't told you before. Thank you. By a vote of 10 to 1, you've approved the ordinance. Okay, thank you all very much. Thanks for hanging in there. Okay, we did not have appointments today. It, it, one more item. Uh oh, one more item. Oh, no. Number nine under planning. Elizabeth. This is the Don't do that to me. Okay.
Uh, resolution to adopt and amend Virginia Beach Comprehensive Plan 2016 storm water impacts for discretionary land use applications deferred from December 7th. Mayor, I have one speaker, Barbara Mesner. Um, now she was supposed to bring some paperwork, but um, adopt and amend the comp plan from 2016 stormwater impacts for discretionary land use applications deferred from December 7th. Um, Planning Commission denial, uh, staff approval. Like I said, we don't have enough time to discuss this. Y'all don't have town hall meetings. And um, you don't abide by the comp plan to begin with. You set the comp plan and uh, yeah, this was, uh, this was, you know, a couple years ago. Um, two points. Uh, 728 billion city owned debt. This is February 15th, 2018, when you had a chance to take care of the police, fire, and rescue. And thank you, uh, Mr. Rouse, again for mentioning other city employees. Um, 1.344 billion bond debt owed. Um, 165 million disability. 68 million retiree health. That's part of the reason for the D rating. Uh, projected to be paid in 26 years, 2043. Thank you. Thank you. That's it, Mayor. Okay, do we have a motion and then we'll have discussion? So moved. To move defer until February 1st. February, February 1st. Okay, the move, uh, the move is to defer until February 1st for now, Second. at which time we will do a reevaluation. Right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Do we have a second? Second. All right. By a vote of 11 to 0, you deferred this to February 1st, 2022. We end the voting with consensus, yes. Okay, any unfinished business at this point? Any new business? Okay, we're going to recess and we have open mic tonight.